Good everyone, good morning judges, audience, uh, everyone watching at home. Um, could we just ask you if you'd like to sit in front so you can see the presentation better? Uh, so my name is Alex, this is my brand, Erdem, and this is our fast, intelligent, and long-range cargo airplane. Our argument is um, that for this case, a supersonic aircraft is the most competitive solution. It's not the easiest, but it's the most competitive. And uh, the aerospace industry, you can see it in Montreal too, uh, the culture of that industry is largely based on operational excellence and of uh, continuous improvement. So in the spirit of continuous improvement, you have to see what the largest issue is in this case and tackle that issue. So we see early on in the presentation and our justification for why we go supersonic, that the largest issue is the cargo depreciation and we have motivation to decrease that amount as much as possible. Um, so we are going to quickly uh, define the problem and uh, discuss the aircraft structure, discuss our engine selection, and then talk about the environment and some of our other choices, and then finish off with the business case. Uh, so firstly, the problem definition. Uh, you just see the shopper just very well outlined the problem, so I won't spend too much time on that. Um, but our payload is 35,000 kilograms in uh, three and two containers. Uh, the original value is $1 million, and the mission is to fly to Mont from Montreal to London and back. Uh, the problem is that the cargo can be used by $20,000 an hour, and the fuel cost is $5 per gallon. Okay. So, um, based on calculations, uh, we know that uh, missions are generally not just crews. So, to accurately estimate the amount of fuel that we need, we need to t uh, consider takeoff, uh, climb out, cruise, descent, and landing. And that's done in the aircraft uh, operating manual or the airport planning manual. They have charts on that and we use those uh, to sort of estimate how much fuel we would need for a certain aircraft. Um, <clears throat> so this is where we see the problem. $140,000 uh, in cargo depreciation for a round trip, um, I, I, sorry, for one single trip from Montreal to London. And this is based on a Boeing 777. Um, that's if we do it today, uh, the M2 pilot can fit on the 747. Uh, but it can also fit on the 777, which is a bit smaller, and it can seem a bit less. Uh, now we compare that to the Concorde, and we see that the distribution of costs is uh, significantly different, and that now most of our costs come from fuel. Um, but the amount of fuel that's consumed by the Concorde, as compared to the 777, is less. Now that's based on the numbers that we got from the Concorde. So this is an estimation, you understand that it might be a bit different, this might be a bit uh, non-conservative, but uh, it's one of our assumptions. So for our baseline aircraft, we chose the Concorde. So this means that we um, started with a design that's very similar to the Concorde and then made modifications to it. Um, so why did we choose the Concorde? Basically, it has proven hours of flight, about 27 years um, or so of it, and it flies at supersonic speeds uh, around Mach 2 at cruise, uh, which is exactly what we wanted. Also, it, um, with some modifications, it can meet our range and the payload requirements. So this is a simple uh, range uh, calculation that we've done here. So as you can see, um, the range is 7,000 uh, kilometers, and the payload is about 13,000 uh, kilograms. So what we've done is we've we've modified our our um, our fuselage to fit our 3M2 pallets, and we've increased our payload to 35,000 kilograms. And um, so. With that addition in payload, we've taken an equal amount of, of fuel weight away, uh, which will reduce our range to five, uh, just about 5,000 kilometers, which is perfect for our um, uh, distance from Montreal to, uh, to London. All right, so now we're going to talk a bit about our aircraft design. Our three main uh, features are the swept wing, our uh, nose reduction tail, and the materials that we used. So we decided to go... Um, the Concorde has a fixed delta wing, but we decided to go with a uh, sweeping wing. Um, and although this is going to add some extra weight, we found other ways to reduce weight. Um, and there's a lot of advantages which I'm going to talk about in having a, a variable sweeping wing. Um, and it's very crucial for our design. So if we look at the straight wing, at subsonic... Um, so we had some calculations at the end of our presentation also, but in the appendix. But as you can see in the graph here, at subsonic speeds, a um, uh, straight wing is a lot, generates a lot higher lift than a, a swept wing. And this is very important for our aircraft, for both landing and for, and for takeoff. 
So at takeoff, we're able to um, generate higher lifts. Um, so this means that we can use our engines without afterburners, um, and which uh, an afterburning is very inefficient. And then, um, but most importantly, during landing. Um, so now we're talking about a cargo aircraft. We're going to be landing with a payload that's about 2.5 times um, that that the Concorde would be landing with. Um, so we're, we need to be able to generate very high lifts at uh, at a small at a uh, low velocity so that we can uh, you know land at a low velocity. Um, and then of course at at supersonic speeds, uh, a sweeping wing is uh, a swept wing is ideal. Uh, this is uh, nicknamed the boom muffler tail. Uh, very simply, it generates a bit of lift, uh, and it's used to reduce the amount of noise that's created by the sonic boom. Uh, Lockheed Martin used this in their uh, business jet concept plane uh, that is also supersonic. Okay, so material, uh, we say how we can improve the seated turrets uh, that uh, in 2000 we had uh, our main uh, uh, the objective is use uh, advanced composite and composite and reduce the uh, metal alloys uh, on the aircraft. So in 2000, we had 10% of the structural mass made of composite. 2010, with the 787, we see the 50% uh, increase, 40% uh, increase, and uh, by 2025, we predict, uh, due to uh, uh, man uh, the uh, maturity of the technology, as well as the introduction of new technology, we can improve this to 60%. Uh, so, the main uh, manufacturing method we use here is AFP, which is the automated fire replacement. It uh, gives us new possibilities. Uh, we uh, use fiber reinforced uh, composites uh, as our uh, primary uh, for primary structures. Uh, the thermoplastic peak be the major uh, material to use on thermoset uh, miner. We also use the other materials as well. Uh, for example, non composite, uh, composite, which is used on F35 at the wing tail uh, fairings which is 10 times less uh, cost than the carbon fiber alternative. Uh, so we try to use all these possibilities, all these materials to uh, basically improve the weight. And then uh, we have, uh, this is just some of the advantage of composites. We have high fatigue load, uh, it doesn't uh, do not uh, corrode, of course, when it's not, the fibers are not in touch with aluminum. Uh, we have excellent fire resistance, uh, they do not, uh, the material doesn't yield, and it has a fuel safe design possibility. Uh, the thermoplastic peak by itself has a superior impact resistance, if negligible uh, moisture, which is great for sandwich, uh, sandwich structures. Uh, we have, uh, uh, res uh, it's recyclable, very uh, in in environmentally friendlier than the previous materials uh, used as, uh, for example, thermosets, and higher melting temperatures. So. And the, uh, the introduction of AFP lets us to use uh, local reinforcement, which also uh, gives us some possibility to reduce weights of the parts uh, that was not possible with previous manufacturing. So, uh, we selected the engine based on uh, a few criteria. Uh, mostly, we wanted to avoid the use of an afterburner, which is possible with the, the F-119 by Pratt & Whitney. Uh, this engine is used on the F-22 Raptor aircraft, and this is a military engine. So you might be thinking, well, how are we going to get our hands on a military engine? And the answer to that is, um, anything is possible. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> engines have been demilitarized before um, for use on, on supersonic aircraft, for civilian supersonic aircraft. Okay. Um, and this one is, uh, in particular, uh, it's, it has 35,000 pounds of thrust without afterburner. Now, the Concorde on its engines had 38,000 pounds of thrust with afterburners. So we tried to stay comparable to that. And um, assuming that we're going to reduce the weight of the total weight of the aircraft, we can have uh, some um, possibilities there. Um, other things that this engine comes with vector to rust, and that is advantageous because our uh, control surfaces don't need to be as large as they would have with non vector thrust. So the engine actually helps to steer the aircraft a little bit. Okay, so let's talk about some innovation and environment. Uh, environmental aspect of this aircraft. On man, why? Because it uh, eliminates the, first of all, we have the cockpit uh, size that we uh, also uh, gain, uh, because uh, this is a cargo airplane. Uh, it, uh, the, uh, it, it pioneers the technology in 2025. Uh, we are advanced in the hopes of science, for sure. And the, uh, it's going to encourage uh, the public and uh, private companies to invest in this uh, the technology. 
Um, uh, and then uh, we can uh, have the uh, uh, certification for the higher uh, mark uh, uh, speed to uh, Okay, so assessing the environmental, so this is our environmental conservation approach. We assess the environmental impacts of this uh, correct. Uh, we uh, do the carbon footprinting, uh, and then we also uh, suggest some solutions uh, for this, uh, for the environmental impact, which is uh, in two types of strategic perspective and operational perspective. Okay, so assessing the environmental impact. In fact, uh, currently the uh, pollution from air freight fer uh, is uh, negligible. <coughs> compared to other uh, transport uh, means of transport, but it's highest in terms of the uh, GHG pollution, it's uh, uh, in terms of gram per kilometer, uh, ton per kilometer. So there needs to be improvement, and government is asking for improvement, continuous improvement. For example, it's to, uh, the CO2 emission is 13 times the water bay, and uh, 10 times trucks, and 18 times trains. So there needs to be lots of uh, improvement in terms of pollution. So a carbon footprint ticket basically starts from raw material and it goes until the uh, disposal and recycling of the product. And uh, what we know is that aluminum requires 15 uh, kilowatt hour per kilogram more energy to produce than carbon fiber. And carbon fiber is in fact a thermoplastic is recyclable. So after 20, 25 or 30 years of life, uh, just, uh, lifespan of this uh, aircraft, it can be actually recycled. Most of it, 60 percent, that's it. And uh, for sure, the aluminum alloys are also to be recyclable as well. So our solution in terms of the strategy, which uh, perspective which we focus on is developing a new vehicle. This is perhaps not uh, possible with the current fleet. Uh, so it's basically improved aerodynamic high load capacity, which uh, the industry uh, itself, uh, they predict uh, the, the train that it will be built in 2025 will have 20 to 20 percent more uh, load capacity uh, due to structural design. We have a lighter overall weight, uh, use recyclable material with less waste uh, due to our manufacturing methods. And uh, we have noise reduction uh, for the tail boom muffler boom design. And then uh, less flight time, uh, so less pollution uh, in, in that sense. Okay, so I said earlier that it's the most competitive solution. Now we're going to see does it really make money? Uh, we estimated the development cost at $1 billion based on other projects that are similar for supersonic business jets. Uh, they, they have estimates of that range. And the capital cost of the aircraft to produce one, let's say, uh, we estimate at $100 million. Um, all right, so I won't go through this whole table, but what you want to pay attention to is uh, the round trip earnings, which is uh, on the second table on the bottom and the third column. Um, so the 777 compared to Concorde, uh, Concord has $739,000 uh, worth of uh, round trip earnings, whereas the sums of around five hundred sixty thousand dollars So we earn a bit more going faster. Now, considering our initial investment, and assuming that we could do four trips per week with one aircraft, um, that's including uh, maintenance time and, and uh, any repairs that are necessary, and uh, depending obviously on the manufacturer of the, the goods that we're transporting, if they can supply those. Um, Anyway, so the earnings per year is about $384 million. Um, and we break even after about seven years. That's with one aircraft. So if we have more aircraft, we reduce that time significantly. Um, <clears throat> it's a, one of the best practices to uh, come up with a SWOT, which is just a very quick way to, to look at the, the situation of the program. Uh, SWOT, for those who don't know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So our strengths we highlighted as uh, we reduce the cargo depreciation significantly because we're so fast. And um, as we're about to see in the next slides, we are very close to all of our suppliers. Uh, weaknesses is uh, we are working with relatively new technologies. So TRL 4 to 6, um, which has its challenges, and we are noisy. So this is something that we know, we have to consider, and uh, but we, we have ways to make it that. Opportunities. Really, the only supersonic freight carrier in the market. Okay, that's worth something. Um, our unmanned system maximizes cargo space, so we don't have to include cockpit or laboratory, but those things are not necessarily uh, pain. Okay, and we set precedence as the first supersonic carrier. Uh, some threats are potential competition, so uh, other suppliers or other OEMs find out about this project and maybe they want to get in on it too. Um, certification is always a, a, an issue. 
and this extremely high investment cost. Um, so we took a look at the supply chain uh, very briefly. We highlighted some uh, main tier one suppliers that we would like to have. Um, we started with uh, Thales uh, to provide the fly-by wire, which is extremely important, especially on my aircraft, uh, and the avionics. Um, Automa Tech, which could provide the wiring and electronics, and uh, the STAR that says M3, that means Mach 3, uh, which is uh, the Aero Montreal's initiative, the Mach initiative, uh, which is sort of in the spirit, again, of, uh, of uh, competitive uh, excellence and, and uh, operational uh, excellence. Evo Good Tech for the landing gear system. PCM innovation to provide uh, assembly tooling, which is extremely important in the assembly of the aircraft. Avior for composite structures, and uh, L3 to integrate the whole thing because they have uh, military experience. And yes. So, uh, just conclusion uh, the appreciation of good, uh, goods might be migrated by short flight duration, so we try to uh, make it uh, very short uh, flight. Uh, then we had some uh, uh, aerodynamic improvements to a certain design, innovative tall increase uh, the level of certification because of the uh, noise reduction. Uh, we had the uh, engine, which uh, Alex uh, said about uh, the uh, opportunities and the advantages of. Unmanned aircraft uh, is uh, paradigm changing, uh, we'll do that. Uh, and then composite materials help keep it uh, low and uh, can recycle. This is uh, one of the ways to make the lighter, uh, more advanced uh, aircraft uh, structure. Uh, break even after 70 years, which we think is a very important point. Thanks for the question. We have 10 minutes of questions. First of all, a very good presentation. Thank you very much for your proposal and uh, your courage of uh, proposing a supersonic uh, proposal. Uh, uh, I'd like to uh, congratulate you on your presentation, especially for uh, thinking about the implications of the supply chain, uh, including the Quebec suppliers. Uh, that's very interesting and uh, appreciated in your presentation. Now, I have uh, one major concern in your proposal. Uh, in terms of payload, basically. Uh, your solution to the, the payload uh, question uh, with uh, uh, using the Concorde and uh, so forth is having the unmanned uh, vehicle. How do you plan to have uh, the different authorization to, to apply that? Uh, so, obviously, we start with Transport Canada, and uh, unmanned certification is sort of new for them, too. Um, and they when, when things are new, uh, there's often a lot of room uh, leniency for, for uh, negotiation and, and things like this. Um, so we would start there, we would start by certifying it for, uh, as a regular aircraft, and then sort of trying to integrate the unmanned into that system. We do still have a pilot though, uh, so it's, it's not that different. We have a pilot at a base station, let's say uh, we have one in Montreal, and then one uh, station in the UK. Um, so, you know, this is uh, places advantageously to pilots as well because uh, they can, let's say one goes in Montreal, he goes into the airport, checks the aircraft, goes into his office cockpit in, in the Montreal airport, flies the aircraft all the way to London, and then at night he just goes home with his wife and kids and he gets to enjoy his life that way. Same thing in the UK. So you could also optimize that and um, get some sort of back and forth thing going that's uh, quite uh, fast. So on the on the side of certification, obviously we start with the camera, FAA, and then ESA, and uh, we, we work with them as much as possible. Thank you. Okay. Um, Cambodia, it's a fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. I see um, how you've been inspired by your university. Um, and don't get me wrong, the romantic in me is very appealed uh, by the resurrection Concorde. Um, I do think there's a lot of optimism in here. Or perhaps we should call it ambition, um, which, which is a good thing. Um, you showed the Breguet range equation, which of course is important to understand whether or not this aircraft is going to achieve the mission requirements um, and to, to sort of think about its efficiency. That equation is very sensitive to your CL and CD values. So where did you get those from, given that this is an aircraft that it isn't just Concorde, it's Concorde plus a whole bunch of other stuff that you talked about. So how would you get your CL and CD value seeing as they're so critical to things like your, your range? 
Um, well, we, we just assumed it would be very similar to the Concord, because um, we used the Concord as our baseline. Um, we would get some, maybe some better improvements on lift over drag ratio, um, because we have a variable sweep wing. So at different speeds, we'll have a more efficient uh, lift over drag ratio. But I mean, it's, it's very difficult to come up with the exact number. Do you have a feel for what kind of weight penalties there are, including the, the mechanism for that variable sweep wing? Um, so we did a kind of analysis comparing two fighter planes um, during the actual last slide there. I don't know if that's up here. Um, so if you look at the F-22 and the F-14, they're very similar aircrafts. One uses a variable sweep wing, one uses a fixed delta wing. And what happens is they're pretty much the same weight. There's a lot of variables to take into account, obviously. But they're able to achieve the same weight, um, very similar takeoff, and um, the F-14 actually uses 30% less wing area. So uh, we believe that we should be able to uh, implement this technology um, without much, too much penalty. And a very quick operational question. If it only takes three hours, why are you only doing four trips per week? An aircraft sat on the ground wasting your money. So, so why, if it's so quick, why are you only doing four of them? Um, there's always unforeseen problems. Um, uh, airport troubles, weather, um, repairs that are needed, any maintenance, uh, engine problems, refueling, the, the fuel guy's not there, um, things like this. So we're just trying to come up with a conservative estimate based on unforeseen things, unknown unknowns. That's a very dear proposal here, and I really like that. I'd like to challenge you on the development cost. You mentioned 1.1 <laughs> <laughs> Uh, did you look into the cost structure of this of this development cost? Does it include the design, the test certification, the ground infrastructure for the pilot and many, many more? Right, okay. Uh, so yes, we do believe that uh, the well currently the C series is costing five billion dollars. Um, we believe that uh, by imp uh, implementing the concrete engineering in the whole process. We will reduce the uh, development time a lot more. Uh, we, by 2025, we will use uh, the technologies that uh, the technology uh, the level readiness will be little uh, below uh, uh, what we, uh, for example, the AFD process manufacturing uh, that is currently in research and uh, we're making parts in 2025. I believe that's going to be um, uh, mature enough. So, uh, yes, we're trying to, uh, we think that we can reduce costs by having a uh, shorter development time in R&D. Well, it's a little controversial in terms of unmanned, but uh, again, that's something that we, uh, we can, if, uh, for example, uh, we can make a decision later uh, if uh, how much development time it takes to do that, and then we'll, we'll, make, the, we'll make that decision uh, so in order to do that. A quick one uh, the uh, DMC of the uh, jet engine is prohibitive. I didn't see in your presentation. Did you take it into consideration the direct maintenance cost? The DMC? The direct maintenance cost of the jet engine is prohibited. I didn't see what you take into consideration in this case. Um, no, we did not uh, take that specifically into consideration. Um, that would be something that we would take into consideration. Congratulations for your presentation. So, I, I'm, in a, I'm an aircraft and this is kind of I, that's what I see also on your side because that with all the you, you took like I would say the best in their class and you made an aircraft out of it and that's that's great that's great. Um, but my question or my uh, you know, like are a bit like a mix of, of my previous colleagues. So in terms of the development cost, absolutely one billion is is not a lot. When you think about the technologies you want to want to use, uh, uh, variable geometry, thrust vectoring. All those things exist on military aircraft, and they are expensive to maintain. They're expensive to do. They are heavy in terms of weight. So um, all that together, together is, is great, but I have doubt, you know, again on development cost because of this, and mainly on certification. Unmanned vehicle, as it, well, it flies today with gear all, all day, you know, about drones, stuff like that. But it's like smaller craft, not crossing the Atlantic as, as far as I know. So that's. Uh, that's quite, quite something. That's a huge challenge for the, you know, the regulation and certification authorities are going to handle your, your project. That's, that's going to be quite important. Yes. But still, congratulations.
congratulations on the great presentation. Um, if there was one uh, one element that I asked for in, uh, in the video that we shot with uh, Civic was uh, be innovative. I think you guys uh, you hit it on with the innovation part. Now this is the part where I'm going to ask you if you own the company and your engineer came to you with this solution, how long would it be that you'd be in your office? <laughs> Like I said earlier uh, at the beginning, it's in the spirit of competitive excellence. So if that's how I run my company, if I say uh, to my engineers, listen guys, I want innovative ideas, I want new ideas, I want out-of-the-box thinking, I want, I want you to be competitive, I want you to think two steps ahead of the next step, then I would keep them in my office. I, they wouldn't uh, accept the project right away, you know, obviously it needs to be developed a lot more, but uh, I would not fire them. <laughs> three weeks and then we sit them down and say, you know, from our your solution what we're getting. Uh, but it, it's good to vision one day and it's good to uh, in three weeks to come up with uh, things that you know that would work best and then uh, go to more detail design on the uh, um, other things that uh, may be too risky let's say that will be as a as a business owner and as a, having been in the industry for, uh, for for a little bit of time now, you've chosen you brought up models like Concord. You brought up engines like the PWF 119 from the F 23 You looked at the F 14 Bombcat. All these aircrafts have had their challenges. The Concorde is no longer around. President Obama took the F 22 out of business. No longer being produced by Lockheed Martin going forward. The Bombcat, a maintenance nightmare. What would inspire me to invest $1 billion and have a return on investment in 7.1, 7.2 years? Those, sorry, I <laughs> <laughs> Those technologies, those aircraft, uh, were based on technology that was from the 80s, uh, from material that was from the 80s, from engineering from the 80s. Uh, right now, we're advancing so quickly uh, in terms of engineering materials, uh, different sorts of ways of using materials, smart materials, um, you know, actuating materials, uh, things like this. Um, if we could integrate those sorts of new developments into the project, I think we could uh, come up with some lessons learned from those uh, previous, uh, previous uh, aircraft and then try to improve on them. Uh, the, the things, the sweat wing from the Tomcat, the engines from the F-22 and the Concorde are just inspiration, they're just ideas. Um, but not to be taken literally. So let's say we take these ideas, we take these concepts and try to develop them into a way that would be easier to maintain, that would cost less on the, the long term. Thank you very much guys. Can you be the next ones? Thank you.